I love this Advent season. And I think everybody does, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, right? There's just this season of anticipation and preparation. And we set up our Christmas trees and our Christmas lights. We decorate the entire house. And it's like all that preparation that goes into those things builds the anticipation for what's to come. Right? And I, I remember just as a kid not being able to sleep at night because we had done all this preparation so that when Christmas is going to come, there was all of this anticipation. And I think that that's fitting because even as followers of Jesus, right, there's so much preparation that comes, which is what Advent is. It's, it's, it's preparing for his arrival. And so as we just intentionally prepare ourselves, how much anticipation do we have that Jesus is coming to dwell in our midst and that's, that's what we're going to be hitting on throughout this whole series of Advent. It's the idea of dwell. And it comes from John 1.14. It says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now, scholars point out that the Greek word dwell is skenao, which is actually drawing on the Old Testament imagery of the tabernacle. So the best translation of this is not that He dwelt among us, but that Jesus tabernacled among us which the Old Testament idea of that is that was the locale of God's presence. So it was the movable locale. And so when they got up and they went somewhere, they brought the tabernacle with them, they set it up and God's presence would dwell at the tabernacle. And so what he's hitting on is that Jesus came and he's present. The presence of God is with us. Now, that is is important because Advent isn't just a a reflection on the fact that Jesus came. And it's not even necessarily just an anticipation that Jesus is coming back to restore all things. It is a fact that he is with us now. And that's the idea of Emmanuel. You probably have heard this throughout Christmas times of Emmanuel, God with us. He tabernacled with us. Advent is about presence. God is in our midst. Now notice the Apostle John, and he alludes to the skene, or the tabernacle. That that wasn't the permanent location of God's presence. That was preceding the temple, which was going to be the more permanent location. Now later in John 14, 17, he says, The Holy Spirit will not only be with you, he will be in you. And then Paul picks this up later in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means that God's presence, his permanent dwelling place is with us and in us. We are with God. God is with us forever. And so Advent is is looking at us now and saying, hey, you have God with you. Mark Sayers in his book, Reappearing Church, says this, and it's a little bit more Eastery, but I think it all kind of fits together. And it says, Jesus' death on the cross tears the curtain of the temple which kept his presence quarantined from the world. Interesting use of the word. With Jesus' sacrifice, he wishes to again fill his temple with his presence. Yet this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, the temple's not the structure that was destroyed by the Roman armies in AD 70. Your body is a living temple. His plan is to fill the world again, his cosmic temple with his presence. That is the end point of history. During this act of his great drama, he moves history towards his purposes by filling us with his presence. I think the question then that comes up is, are we open to it? Are we open and available for God's presence to come? Are we pursuing and seeking, noticing and preparing for his presence? Now, the allusion back to the temple um, and the tabernacle, I think is interesting because if you have read Leviticus or Numbers, which, you know, sometimes they're hard to read, but I genuinely love them because I see Jesus in all of it. But if you read it, there's always this, like, just so much preparation. They call it consecration. There's intentionality. This needs to go with that, and this needs to be made with a certain material. There's an artistry that went into it to prepare it for the presence of God to dwell. There was intentionality. Now, We've all know what it's like to be unprepared. I mean, we've all experienced that at some point, whether it was unprepared for a test, unprepared for a guest to come into your home, unprepared for a job interview or for that presentation in front of a new client. Like we just know what it's like to be unprepared. No one likes that feeling. And there's this sense that, again, as we talk about Christmas and Advent, as this is preparation builds anticipation. 
We know what it's like when we've gone above and beyond to prepare room for someone to come so that we can host them in our house. And just, it brings a sense of joy and anticipation for them to come. So I want to talk about preparation. The idea of preparing him room. See, in Luke 2, this is kind of the Advent story. You see that Jesus is is coming into the scene right before he's born. There's a census that's going on. In verse 4, it says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who had been pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this is kind of like a a throwaway line. There's no guest room available for him, but I think this is really interesting. They had no room prepared. This is an earthy scene. And we, we kind of miss it because in the Advent nativity scenes, you know, Jesus is beautiful with his little glow and there's always little lambs around. It's cute and stuff. But but think about the earthiness of this scene. This is a peasant girl, right? She's not serene. She just traveled a long distance. She's young. She's bone weary. There's no divine heavenly glow around her. Just one look at her, you'd be able to tell how horrible of a night this was. I mean, giving birth in the middle of of nowhere. This is a dirty feeding trough where there's this newborn wrapped in dirty clothes and blankets. This is a feel more of a desperate, undesired homelessness. One that we'd probably see underneath a bridge, less of underneath a Christmas tree. So if this scene were to happen, if we were to be here in the first century, we saw this, we would miss it. We, we would not have thought this is the incarnate God. This is the savior of the world because there was a lack of preparation. We would have totally missed it. There was no room available for them. So how do we prepare room? Well, what I love about the story of scripture is every time there's a visitation, every time God shows up in a unique way, there is always something, there's some kind of preparation. And so if, even for Jesus, there was some kind of preparation. So just before this, um, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin is born again in an obscure way. And it says this in Luke 1. I'm going to start in verse 14. Now, Zechariah, his dad, he was working in the temple because he was a priest. And an angel shows up to him. And the angel says this, Your son, he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, this part, this next part, we're going to hone in on later. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Verse 16, he will bring back many of the people of Israel from the Lord, of, to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So just before Jesus enters the scene, God sets up another, a preparer. Now this idea is what I'm going to be leaning into every time. Every time God shows up, there's a preparation. There's some kind of intentional setting aside or intentional preparation before the visitation. So the question is, how do we intentionally prepare room in our lives, in our jobs, in our friendships, in our families, in our world? How do we prepare room for Jesus to dwell? So the idea today is we want to dwell in preparation or we want to prepare for God to dwell. Now, the biblical idea for making space in our lives to to ready is the word prepare. But in some cases, in some cases, in special cases, especially if you wanted to uh, prepare in such a way for a a status visitor, for God Himself, that word was consecration. Now, consecration is the word kadash. To consecrate was to set something apart. It was to dedicate it for service. It was to remove it from common use and subject to special treatment. So if you wanted to consecrate something, you were to prepare with a unique intentionality for the purpose of God to dwell and move in your midst. Consecration. We want to be consecrated. We want to have a set intentionality with how we prepare ourselves for God to show up and move in our midst. But the question is, do we have room? 
do we have room? So how do we prepare room? Now I'm going to dive back into Numbers 6. Now Numbers isn't necessarily an Advent uh, verse. It's not something you necessarily pick up and read during Advent. But I think this is important for us to read because in this time, they're just about to leave Mount Sinai. They've been there for an entire year and God has just given them all of these kind of ways that they can prepare themselves to enter into the promised land. God has been intentional and specific with them. He says, hey, if you want to enter the promised land, here's some ways that you can prepare yourself. And then he gets into this really weird thing that I want to hit on. I think he's kind of set up our conversation of how do we prepare ourselves? And he talks about this thing called a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow. So number six, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite. Now, a special vow in Hebrew was the word plea, which is translated in other places as miraculous or amazing things. So if you wanted to make a vow to have God's presence dwell for a miraculous and amazing thing, verse 3, they must abstain from wine or other fermented drink, which for us, big bummer, no kombucha. But you must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They may not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under the Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor even the seeds or skins. So if you wanted to see a work of God in your life, if you wanted to prepare room for him, you would abstain from wine. But it was also raisins, it was fermented beverages, it was grapes. So back then... Wine, raisins, grapes, all that stuff. Many of those things were actually delicacies. Those were things you'd have at festivals, you'd have, have at parties. Like they were like for us desserts. But wine, wine was the social center of what it meant to be Hebrew. I mean, you would have wine at every meal, every Sabbath. There's a place in the Old Testament in Exodus where it says that you're commanded during the Passover festival to drink four glasses of wine. Some of you are like, amen, that's legit. But what this is saying is that if you want to do a vow, if you wanted to just intentionally set aside things in your life, you wanted to focus your gaze on God, you wanted to prepare room for Him, for Him to show up, you would have to rearrange some things in your life. You would have to rearrange your social life. You would rearrange habits and the ordinary things to set yourself apart for extraordinary things. So every Sabbath, every wedding, every festival, you kind of have to opt out of it. Or you'd have to do it a little bit differently because pursuing God often requires a kind of change in our lifestyle. So it's fitting in Advent as we, we kind of change things. The season changes. We change, thing, we change things a bit. There's an intentionality that we can do to put in there so that we can be ready for extraordinary things. Verse 5. During this entire period of the Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must, let, they must let their hair grow long. Now, I know what you're thinking. I am not taking a Nazarite vow. But Nazarites, they would walk around with these long dreads, right? And it was a symbol of their dedication. There was a physical representation of this commitment to the Lord. I mean, you could tell when they walked around, they're like, oh, there's a Nazarite. That guy's committed to the Lord because of the way that they, that they look. They carried themselves in a way that resembled this fact that they were preparing room for God. It was a wild pursuit of God. So a fully surrendered life, not just in what you consumed, but how you appeared was put on display to represent that you were set apart. Verse 6, throughout the period of the dedication of the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. And you're like, easy enough. I don't touch dead people. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication of God is on their head. Throughout the period of the dedication, they are consecrated to the Lord. Now, again, easy enough. I'm not going to touch any dead people. I don't touch dead people on a regular basis. But if you have to think about the ancient Near Eastern context, they didn't have hospitals. They didn't have hospices. And the life expectancy was much less. So if grandpa was going to die, grandpa's dying in your house. 
And so the implications of this was just so significant. I mean, not drinking wine, um, you had to like remove yourself from all of those things, not cutting your hair, and then not touching dead bodies. The implications were so steep that scholars actually believe if you wanted to be a Nazarite, most likely you'd have to move out of your house. You'd have to move into the wilderness so that you wouldn't be ceremonially unclean. You wouldn't come in contact with a dead body. This had social implications and communal participation because everyone had to know that this is what you were doing to make sure that you didn't fall into the hands of becoming unclean. It was a pursuit of God in a radical way. Now, this vow would last, you know, probably like 30 days, but some people were Nazarites for life. You know, Samuel, Samson in the Old Testament. As I read before, John the Baptist was believed to be a Nazarite, where he didn't drink any any drink. He went off into the wilderness. So a lot of scholars actually believe that he was a Nazarite. Now, it makes sense. He would take the special vow. He was set apart. He was intentional in his preparation before the visitation of Jesus. And so there was a set time that you would dedicate yourself. And it didn't have to be anything specific, but it was just this intentionality of setting yourself aside, creating room for God to show up. Verse 13 because if you wanted to finish your vow, this is what would happen. Now, this is the law of the Nazarite. When the period of their dedication is over, they are to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting, ready for their offerings. They are to present their offerings to the Lord, a year old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year old ewe lamb without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a fellowship offering, together with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and a basket of bread made with the finest flour and without yeast, thick loaves with olive oil mixed in and thin loaves brushed with olive oil. The priest is to present all these things before the Lord and make the sin offering and the burnt offering. He is to present the basket unleavened bread and is to sacrifice the ram as a fellowship offering to the Lord together with the grain offering and the drink offering. And after all of these offerings, right? So many offerings. Then, then at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the Nazarite must shave off their hair that symbolizes their dedication. They are to take their hair Put it in the fire that's under the sacrifice of the fellowship offering. I mean, so there's like all of these offerings. There is a male lamb, a year old male a ewe lamb. There's a ram, a grain offering, a drink offering, a basket of bread. And then they would shave their heads. Now, scholars actually believe this was so expensive. This was so expensive that no one could actually do it on their own, especially if you're living in the wilderness to get away from dead bodies, that you couldn't actually fulfill this on your own. They believe it actually took a community effort. Many of them had sponsors. I think this is a beautiful image of what it means to like pursue God is you can't do it alone. We cannot create room. We cannot pursue God. We cannot set, set things in our lives apart without the community. And so this is what's getting at. There's a participation in the community to help us all set aside room in our lives. Now imagine that you're at the temple. You're either doing your daily sacrifice, you're just there for worship, and you smell burnt hair. Like everyone knows that smell. It smells disgusting. But for them, they would be like, oh, do you smell that? Someone just gave everything to God. That's what dedication smells like. That's what an entire life of passion and devotion smells like. So the point for us, like church, is not to shave our heads. <laughs> Do not hear me say that. I'm not even saying you have to stop drinking wine. I'm not saying any of those things. But the point of this is to highlight how incredible it is to see that every time visitation happens, there's a time of preparation. Well, we need to prepare with intentionality to create space for God to dwell in our lives. We want to act and we want to think and we want to live the way that Jesus acted and thought and lived. This is the goal. Now, before we dive even further, I want to say a note against legalism. Because there could be this tendency as I'm saying all this, like, oh man, I got to give up this. I got to add this. I got to do this. And Please do not hear me say that. That's not what I'm saying at all. Like every time there's a New Testament letter that was written, Paul said to the saints in Ephesus, to the holy ones in Rome, to the holy ones in Thessalonica, to the holy ones in Philippi, right? He always makes a declarative statement, you are holy. And then he follows it by saying, therefore live holy, but you are holy. So I just want to say this, you cannot be more loved than you already are. You cannot 
do anything that's going to make God love you more than you already are loved. God's not going to love you more because you stop drinking alcohol. God's not going to love you more because you start praying seven times a day or because you go to every church service and watch the online at the same time, right? There's nothing that you could do to make God love you more. But he calls us to live a life set apart. He calls us, invites us to prepare space in our lives for him to dwell and show up so that we can be transformed to look like Jesus. So the point is that we would prepare ourselves, that we would order our lives, we would model our lives, that we would live our lives in such a way that there'd be time and space for God to show up. So again, consecration is this intentional setting apart and preparing for God to dwell. You see this throughout the Bible. Moses, before the Ten Commandments came, God said, consecrate yourselves. And then he showed up on Mount Sinai in a cloud of fire and smoke. Um, Joshua, before he crossed over the river Jordan, God said, consecrate yourself. And then God showed up in a miraculous way. David, when he's trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of David, the Levites had to consecrate themselves before the Ark could enter. And then again, is Solomon, his son, in 2 Chronicles 5, he was preparing the temple. He's consecrating. He's doing all these things. And it says the glory of God showed up in the temple with such thickness that the Levites and the priests could not even perform. Like they couldn't even do their job because the presence of God was so thick. I mean, there's an intentional preparation that always precedes visitation. Preparation always precedes presence. So now I want to dive into the New Testament because I want you to see how this is actually still prevalent. Paul in Acts 19. Now Paul's going to this going to Ephesus and he realizes that they don't have the Holy Spirit. And so he says, hey, do you guys have the Holy Spirit? What baptism do you guys have? And they're like, oh, we have John's baptism. He's like, no, 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 you need the Holy Spirit. So he prays over them. Holy Spirit comes, miracles start happening. Now, Ephesus is the second largest city in the Roman Empire at this time. There's 250,000 people. It's the epicenter of Artemis worship, which was a cult deity, uh, temple prostitution, full sexual expression in, of that to that deity. It was a pagan town. It was a banking capital. It was a port city. I mean, so much in this city was against God. He goes and he preaches the word. He begins to spread. And then it says in Acts 19.11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. That's weird. That's weird stuff that's going on. And I'm even wondering like where those handkerchiefs used because like COVID and stuff, <clears throat> as I cough, um, it says extraordinary miracles. Luke had to make up this phrase because there was no word or combination of words that really was explaining the crazy miracles that were going on. So he had to make up this Greek phrase, extraordinary miracles. So in verse 19, it says, so many people were transformed by the presence of God that the Ephesians Christians began to burn their sorcery scrolls and idols. Now it says that uh, our scholars look at, it says about $5 million worth of stuff was burned. Now that is an intentional step of preparation. That the Christians said, no, no, we can't live this way anymore. We can't, we can't live with these idols, these things in our lives anymore. We need to prepare room for God to dwell. We can't do life as normal anywhere anymore. We want to have the life of Jesus. And then in verse 20, it says, in this way, because the Christians got rid of their idols, right? They prepared room. The word of the Lord spread and wi spread widely and grew in power. Now, right after this happens in the next scene, um, there's actually a riot that happens because the idol makers and the, and the people who would like prepare sacrifices, they were out of business because the economy was shifted because the Christians decided we're not going to do that anymore. So there was actually a riot. I mean, like Christianity changed the culture, it changed the economy. I mean, don't we want that? We want to live in such a way we've prepared so much room for God that it changes not just us, but everything around us, right? We want there to be a shift in our culture where there's an end to homelessness, where there's no more drug addiction, there's no more divorce and single parents, there's no more hatred and that, that pollution's gone, right? We want to live in a way that our economy and our socioeconomic, everything around us would shift because God is dwelling. We want that. The question is, 
not just about this obscure passage where Paul does incredible, miraculous things in Ephesus. Because that's like, well, what is that all about? Why does that even matter? The question is what happened before. In Acts 18, 18, what happened with Paul right before Ephesus? Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off because of a vow that he had taken. And then he arrived at Ephesus. Intentional preparation in our lives makes way for God to dwell and move in our midst. If you want to see God move, you want to create room for God to dwell in your midst. Intentional preparation. How are we intentionally creating space in our lives? There's a direct connection between the church's ability to seek God, intentionally prepare space for him and him dwelling in their midst. So Advent, again, it's not about Jesus just came. It's not that he's coming again. It's that he is with us now and wants to dwell in our midst. So the questions that I want to just leave us with is how are we preparing room for God this season? What in your life is distracting you from being the person that God has called you to be? I think for some people, there might be a specific thing or things that are occupying and busying and clustering the space in your life that God wants to dwell. It could be overworking. I mean, it could be overconsumption. It could, it could be a number of things, but the question for you that you have to wrestle out with the Holy Spirit is what is it that's, that's clustering the room in your life that God wants to dwell? And for others, maybe it's just a lack of intentionality. I mean, maybe we're like, yeah, you know, like God's cool and all of that. But really, if you look at your life, it's just wake up, have breakfast, go to work, have dinner. And the grind goes on and on. And, and the days just seem to be going on an autopilot. And God is calling you to step in with an intentionality. How are you intentionally preparing yourself, preparing room for God to show up? How are we being so intentional with looking for God, for seeking God in such a way that we couldn't miss his presence? Jesus came incarnate in a way that we would have missed him. But when he came, he came in such a way so that we would be aware of his presence, that we would be transformed to look like him. Christmas is about us becoming like the incarnate Jesus. So how are we preparing room for him? So if you want more of God, if you want God to show up in your life and you want him to show up in our church and in our county, the question is, what's getting in the way of his presence dwelling? So the the practice for us is actually just a practice of intentionality. How do we be intentional around how we order and think about our lives and set up our lives? How do we intentionally prepare room for God? Would you guys pray with me? God, we first want to say thank you that we can't do anything to earn your love. That in Romans 5, it even says um, that while we were still sinners, while we were powerless, you died for us. That you came to die for us. You gave your life for us. You entered the world for us. Not when we are perfect, but when we are completely imperfect. And so God, I pray just against any sense of legalism that this, like anyone would hear this as a sense if we need to tidy ourselves up in order to, um, to experience, to know your love. God, I pray that this is just more of a reminder that, that we just need to create space for you. That you're actually pursuing us and desiring to be with us. And that that's not stopping, but so often in our lives, we're actually just pushing you away. And so God, will we just right now just say, we don't want to push you away. We want to have room for you to dwell in our midst. And God, I ask for you to show up, not just in in a cute kind of comforting way. Um, Yes, that, but also in, in a way where you do miraculous things in our lives, that we see you show up in ways that changes everything about us. We want to look like you. We want our our town to look like you. We want the economy to be shaped by you. We want our church to be filled with your presence, God. And so would you help us? Would you bring to our mind even now the things in our lives where we're not being intentional or the things in our lives that are clustering the space that you want to dwell? And so God, we just ask, Holy Spirit, come. 
pray this in your name. Amen.